Hi, everyone. This is Dee Marley again with the History of Arts podcast. Thank you for joining us today. And we are so thrilled to have Laura Vosica on the show today. And she is the author of the Bluebell Chronicles. But we would love to turn this over to you, Laura, and let you tell the listeners a little bit more about you and your writing journey and about your books. And we're really excited for you to tell our listeners about those. Fantastic. Um, I wish I'd brought the sack butt as a prop <laughs> for all of those. I have a shirt that says got sack, but it's medieval trombone. And strangely enough, this sort of started with trombone because that's what I played. I majored in college oh, in. Okay. And that's where the title of the first book comes from. The Now, this is an old cover, and it's my work copy. There's a new cover now, but the okay. book is Bluebells of Scotland. Mm -hmm. And it is, this is the name of a piece that trombone players love to try and play, okay. and the good ones can do quite well. And it's a piece that was written very specifically to prove that a trombone can do more than go oompa, oompa, because <laughs> it's... Um, it's a very unwieldy instrument. It's not easy yes. to play well. Um, like I say, you can trip over a harp and it still sounds pretty. Um, <laughs> I can say that because I do play harp too, as as does one of my characters. And so, but this this piece really proved that there's a lot more to the instrument. And that wow. sort of becomes the theme in the book because it's about this arrogant, obnoxious trombonist. And any trombonist listening will say, yes, that's redundant because <laughs> um, <laughs> we have an opinion of ourselves. <laughs> and so one night I, he's, he's causing a problem for his orchestra because he is Mr. Personality Plus in addition to being obnoxious and arrogant, he's very smart business-wise, in addition to being a very talented musician. And he has brought this orchestra just to great financial success. Mm -hmm. But they're also afraid they're going to get sued. Because <laughs> yeah. he's partying everywhere he goes. He's just, he's terrible. And so one night his girlfriend has enough. And she abandons him in a tower, a Scottish medieval tower, when they're on tour in oh. Scotland. And he wakes up in the wrong century. Um, so um, this was meant to be a standalone book uh -huh. because I thought I wrote a certain ending. And my sister read it and she said, so what happens next? Oh. I thought, well, given the ending I wrote, there's nothing that can happen next. And I read it again, and I realized I didn't actually write the ending I thought I had. And I thought, well, uh -oh. that's interesting. What if? What if? And so I wrote the second book. And this also, this cover has been replaced. Mm -hmm. um, this is the old one. And so I wrote, what happens if he's trapped in medieval Scotland? And so let me see. I'm trying to remember the order my books go in. <laughs> um, you'll notice on the next books, there is a theme of kind of looking through a door. Yeah. And so this is the second half of part two. And <laughs> I have to look at my covers to remember. It's been so long since I wrote them. <laughs> And then here's part four. This is actually Fingal's Cave, and there's a cross in there. Mm -hmm. And what happens when you go through this life-changing experience, and how does that impact the rest of your life to yeah. have lived as a modern person in a very brutal time in medieval Scotland mm -hmm. and to come back to your own life? And so that was a lot of fun and a lot of research. And I did want to mention, um, this is a book I wrote with my husband. So this also, oh. it takes place in the modern day in a historic St. Paul mansion that my husband and I have actually been in. And awesome. it's spring, however, from all the medieval research I was doing for the uh -huh. Bluebells Chronicles. And we wrote that into the story of the saint in the cellar and the little boy in this big mansion what what he's experiencing oh that sounds amazing so how how much influence do you feel like you know because you know whenever people think of Scotland and time travel and things like that of course they're going to think of Diana Gabaldon so you know how much influence did that have with you in wanting to write about this era 
Um, absolutely none. Because, and, and this is funny, because when I started writing it, I had never heard of Diana Gabaldone or Outlander. Okay. So if anything, more of an influence on my books is a very wonderful person named Margaret Anderson, okay. who I was lucky enough to interview on my podcast, Books and Brews. And back in the 70s, she wrote a book, a children's novel called In the Keep of Time. And while I didn't deliberately copy that, it's about four children who go into a castle keep mm -hmm. and come out in the wrong century. Now, I did benefit, however, from Diana Gabaldon because it turned out that a lot of people who first read my book when it first came out went to the Diana Gabaldon, the Outlander Forum, and said, if you love time oh. travel in Scotland, <laughs> you're going to love this. Oh, well, that's and great. So I found that, yeah, I found that people who read and like Outlander tend to also love my books. Good. Now, there are a couple of differences. Um, the major one being that hers is set in the Jacobite era. I yeah. want to say about 1749, yeah. 1750s. And mine are set about 200 years earlier in the Battle of Bannockburn, 1314. Okay. So mine is very medieval where hers yeah. is later than that. But if you love Scottish history, you will get a doesn't? great taste of Scottish history. <laughs> I yeah. think we all love Scottish history. <laughs> it's, it's a fascinating field. It really is. It really yeah. is. So in talking about the history of Scotland and about the research that you had to do, can you tell us a little bit about what was entailed in your in your research and you said that you were able to visit you know the yes um, areas so yeah can you tell us well about that? yeah it's it's interesting when I started writing this I knew nothing so I wrote the first draft um I was thinking of uh what's what's the one with Mel Gibson I should know <laughs> this um Braveheart so yeah. I put them all in kilts I did know not to give them blue paint <laughs> And then I started doing my research. I went, oh man, I have yes. to take all their clothes all of off, off and right. give them a whole new wardrobe. Um, <laughs> so that was interesting. But boy, the history of Robert the Bruce, of uh, King Edward the First, King Edward the Second, their personalities. It's a fascinating history. And you really start to understand how personalities drive history you know we tend um, to think that this definitely. is the way it happened and then you look at it and go yeah but if he hadn't been so arrogant and brazen and full of pride yeah. it wouldn't have so you asked about visiting there and I've been there five times and oh. so what I do is I'll usually write the first draft and then I'll try and visit every single place that I write about in the book Wow. And so um, <laughs> there goes the dog. You might hear her whining. <laughs> That's okay. She's, she's listening to the we rooster We love dogs. Crow. Dogs and books are great. Yeah, yeah. The rooster is singing, so she's going to sing back. <laughs> um, so, and, and it's fun going there for research because you don't necessarily go to the famous places or the tourist spots. You go to places like where does the bad guy start to attack people and kill people? So I was looking for dark alleys in Scotland <laughs> and I went to, I forget what it's called because it's been a long time, but there is a great entertainment center in Inverness. And I went there and I asked, will you take me backstage? Will you show me the green room? I'm writing a book and I want it to be accurate. And a lovely woman named Judith, Judith was very nice. And she said, I will do that, but not today because Prince Andrew is coming. So can you come oh. back tomorrow? <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> so okay. I miss Prince Andrew by that much. Oh, well. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I really got to some neat places and had a lot of fun seeing all there is to see. I took medieval boots and I climbed up the mountains that Sean oh. actually does hike in medieval boots. I tried to do everything that they do in the books so that it could be accurate. And I'm very happy to say that one of some of the feedback I get from Scottish readers is they often don't like American writers writing in Scotland because they don't get it right. And I've gotten really good feedback that I got it right. Oh, so that's so good. And, and you know, that makes me really happy. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and one thing we, I think we've all learned as historical fiction authors is that, 
that matters to the readers. Mm -hmm. um, accuracy absolutely does matter. It does. And I have a funny story about that. And I think why I am so um, determined to get it right. My first oh. husband is from Ireland. Yeah. Can you see her? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. She'll <laughs> whine if I'm in, she'll whine if I'm out. As long as she's with me, she's fine. Yes. Um, so my first husband is actually from Ireland and we were married for 23 years. And one day he was reading a book about Robin Hood. And all of a sudden, he just, figuratively speaking, threw it down. He's like, I can't finish this book. Mm -hmm. They just had Robin Hood eating potatoes. Oh. I was like 22, 23. <laughs> I had no idea they didn't have potatoes in England at the time. Or yeah. Ireland, is a, I guess the book was set in England, of course. But being from Ireland, he knew that. He knew yes. that potatoes were very relatively recent to the yeah. country. And that really made an impact on me that you have to get it right as much as humanly possible because there's someone out there who does know that. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point, especially for um, young authors that are starting out and want to go in, want to venture into historical fiction. It's a, it's a very unique um, field to get into. It's not just like writing a contemporary book where you know basically everything and can get away with a lot more. Historical fiction is very particular and mm -hmm. you have to get those things right. Um, there's so much discussion about that, about, about, yes. you know, what can you, what, how much leeway do you have? And not very much. <laughs> right. Well, and that's why I ended up actually creating a fictional castle. Now the castle is based 100% on Urquhart Castle on the shores of Loch Ness, okay. but the problem was I knew so much about the history of Urquhart that I couldn't believe the story myself. If I called it Urquhart Castle, I'm like, I know yeah. the Laird didn't live at Urquhart because I know who right. did. Right. And so I made it a fictional castle and I kind of imply that it's close to Urquhart. And uh -huh. in fact, this is another thing that makes me happy. I made it real enough that one day I discovered people are actually doing searches. Is Glen oh. Merrill real? Where is Glen Merrill? <laughs> Well, that, um, that's the best, that's the best compliment. For I, I was to able to do that. when I saw that. Yes, yeah. that's amazing. That's so amazing. So your entire series, um, it follows the same um, group or the same mm -hmm. characters all the way through the series. Um, right. And, and what is your latest one? So um, let's see, these books have all been published the uh, last of the episode is here okay. now the most recent book i've put out let me see from this pile of books i've got here i do put out <laughs> an annual poetry anthology okay and these are two of them i have all my books packed up right now to go to farmers markets and things so okay. i didn't go dig in the car that's okay <laughs> um yeah the saint in the cellar is the most recent okay. one and what I'm working on right now, um, so I'll just mention, this is my husband's book. So he's okay. also an author. Nice. Yeah, this is a medical memoir about his wife's, his first wife's illness and passing. And it's wow. actually that close to being used in a medical school to help teach doctors more about complex illness and bedside manner and oh, wow. dealing with difficult cases. So I'm, I'm pretty proud of that. I'm sure you are. But Right. So what Chris and I are working on now is what we call the Ivy Leak series. Oh. And Ivy Leak actually sprang from January 2019 when I went to the Amelia Island Book Festival to sell my books and I made my 16 year old son come with me. So we had a very long drive from Florida back up to Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And I was sick and it was January and I needed chicken noodle soup. And we stopped at IHOP about 10 o'clock at night and he ordered steak. I ordered chicken noodle soup and they brought him his steak and 20 minutes later came out and said, I'm sorry, we don't have any chicken noodle soup. <laughs> <laughs> so to this day my son he's 22 now to this day he keeps teasing me about how much I supposedly hate IHOP but I started <laughs> thinking why does it take 20 minutes to tell me you're out of chicken noodle soup and of course you know so how funny. it is being an author so um now there is murder and mayhem and all sorts of hijinks in this little town um Chris and I had driven through Elba Alabama 
Mm-hmm. No, I'm sorry. See, I forgot which one is real and which one I made up. I think it's El- I think there is an Elba, Alabama. So our fictional town instead of Elba, Alabama is Shoulder, Alabama. <laughs> okay. And it's a town of 400 and there are all these characters. And so the fun of this story is that almost all of the names come from road signs. So we're traveling through Alabama and we see a sign for a little branch of a creek called Beulah Branch. Mm -hmm. We thought that sounds like a character. That's got to be a name. And we passed through another sign where it's Jemison. The town of Jemison is Uh on the top. The town of Thorsby is on the bottom, you know, pointing which way to go. And we're like, Jemison Thorsby? That sounds like a Southern lawyer. Uh (laughs) And so almost all the names are straight off road signs. Oh, that's remarkable. Yeah. And so as the series continues, Ivy Leak, the the main character is Ivy Leak. Her father is a biologist and he thought that, um, what is her name? Isoptera vulpina, something like that. (laughs) Because he's a biologist and he's like, I just thought that was the most beautiful sound. (laughs) And she's like, dad, what have you done to me? So she went by her initials, IV. But then she started working for her husband in his medical clinic. (laughs) And every time someone called her, someone came running with the IV pole. So she (laughs) changed her name to Ivy. So that's why she's Ivy Lee. And she and her son, River, travel the country and get embroiled in mysteries. And these all kind of come from our real life. Things that happen (laughs) to us that we go, hmm. Yeah. (laughs) That would make a good Ivy Lee story. That, that sounds so great. I'm sure our listeners are going to be thrilled to to read those books. Not only your your time travel books, but those as well. That's, those sound really great. I'm excited to have the first two finished. I'm working on two of them right now, but there are three more that are already planned out. Okay, good. And when are those? When are they supposed to be able to be available? Well, because I do my own publishing, they're available when I get to them. Right. (laughs) And I am trying to make that, you know, on a regular schedule. Um, You can see behind us, we have some land here and we've been learning how to raise sheep and chickens and we breed rabbits. So my days are pretty busy. So I'm back to what I did with my first series where I start writing at 10 o'clock at night. And if I'm lucky, I'm in bed by three. And then I get up at 8.30 8.30 and start all over again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes that's the best time to write <laughs> whenever it's, it's dark. And it quiet. really works for me. Right. Yeah. Because as you've seen, the dog is back and forth and she's now <laughs> pawing at the door, you know, all day long. It's like, there's something that has to be done at night. Yeah. Everybody's asleep. All the animals are asleep. The dogs yeah. are asleep. I don't have to be interrupted. Yeah. So do you have any, are are, there, is, are you having any kind of events or anything where people might can come see you or, or get a book yeah. signed? Yes, I will be at the Morristown Farmers Markets. I think the dates are June 7th and July 5th. They're Friday okay. nights. Okay. And so that's a really neat event in Morristown, Tennessee. Okay. And other than that, you know, the big thing going on is my publishing company, Gabriel Horn, is taking submissions for the next two poetry anthologies. Um, the theme of one is music and the theme of the other is faith nice. and and then we're building up our homestead and so if people are in this area want to buy meat or eggs or rabbits uh, mm-hmm. sheep that's kind of what, what we're working on <laughs> and books definitely books yeah that's kind of what we're working on now well that sounds really great well uh, be sure and tell our listeners about your website where where they can go to your website Yep, lauravosika.com. And so that's V as in Victor, O S I K A. And I believe the other address to the same place is bluebellschronicles.com. Okay. okay. And we'll be sure and put those links up at the end of the, um, the podcast today. So, and on, on the description. So, for our listeners, if you want to go to that link and go find Laura's books, you can go there and be directed straight to her website. And also, I'm sure you can find them on Amazon, right? They're all on Amazon. And in fact, I have a few others too. So I've got a journal called The Four Spheres that helps you build habits for better life. I have a collection of music. Um, It currently has a one-star review because somebody didn't like that it was music and not a novel. Go figure. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, you so know that curious. actually one star actually sometimes makes people buy it more. <laughs> Does it? Well, it's it's hilarious because the review says I gave this a one star review to warn other people that this isn't a novel. <laughs> like oh I goodness. contacted Amazon. That's not fair. They're like, whatever. Well. <laughs> Okay. Well, I believe that that's going to help you sell sell more books. Actually, I hope so. <laughs> My very first review was a one star, and I've sold a lot oh. of books since then. So, <laughs> I, I figured if you're going to get a one star, that's a pretty good reason that that's absolutely right. Didn't read the cover, <laughs> so that's better than saying this music is really awful. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. And to all our listeners out there, please don't forget to go check out Laura's books and her website. We will put, be putting those links up, as I said, at the end of the podcast. So be sure and to click on that. And also, please don't forget to click on our subscribe button so you can continue to listen to our interviews here at the History Bards podcast. Thank you for listening today. Thank you again to Laura and to her doggy for being on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. And to all our listeners, please don't forget, keep making history and keep listening. Mm -hmm.